there are specific things that that individual is brought on board to do, and you measure that performance. That all goes back to leading, delegating, motivating, managing employees correctly, you know, um, providing clear direction in no uncertain terms, exactly what you expect and when, holding people accountable to the goals, measuring performance and behavior, not personal, you know, so it's never measuring the person or, or, you know, making things personal. It's always about the business. It's always about the performance, it's always about the behavior. And you set very specific goals and you track those goals and you help people, um, you know, hold themselves accountable to those goals and you track their performance and then they can share in the upside. So that's basically, you know, how it, you know, how that evolved and how that works. Welcome to the How to Scale Commercial Real Estate Show. Whether you are an active or passive investor, we'll teach you how to scale your real estate investing business into something big. Greg Dickerson is a serial entrepreneur. He's a real estate developer. He's a coach and also a mentor. Greg, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Hey, the pleasure's mine. Three questions I ask every guest who comes on the show in 90 seconds or less. Can you tell me where did you start? Where are you now? How did you get there? So uh, from a business standpoint or ge geography? It's your 90 seconds. <laughs> so I went in the Navy right out of high school, uh, did not go to college, did four years in the Navy, did retail. And when I got out of the Navy, I worked in the uh, corporate restaurant industry for a little while for, for several years. So the Navy was 85 to 89 and then um, always had a side business uh, while I was working in restaurants doing construction, little odd jobs, building decks, fences, handyman work, whatever. In 1997, I moved to the Outer Banks of North Carolina. That's where flight originated. That's where the Wright brothers took off in Kildover Hills, North Carolina. I moved there in 1997 to open a restaurant. I got into construction instead, started a little remodeling handyman company. Um, my first year did about 250,000 in sales. Seven years later, we were doing $30 million. We were the largest, uh, one of the largest builder developers there. I sold that company, uh, started 12 other companies along the way during that seven year time period, built them up, sold them off. And uh, what I did was I reinvested all the profits into other development deals and just grew and scaled my development business from uh, single family residential to land to mixed use commercial and on and on. So that's what I've been doing since 1997. Uh, building and scaling, growing companies, starting, building, scaling, growing, and exiting companies, uh, doing real estate development deals, doing value add deals, and uh, and then coaching now, coaching and mentoring people all over the country, teaching them how to do the same thing. What were some of the skills or some of the things you had to learn going from swinging a hammer to growing a business? Because that's a that's that's a that's a big mindset shift for a lot of people, and that's a hard bridge for some people to cross. How did you do that? Yeah, it is. And, and I literally started just me, my, my truck and my tools, you know, no employees. And then I, you know, hired another employee, then another one, and then just kind of grew and scaled from there. So, you know, I was very fortunate. I learned, um, you know, business and accounting in the military with retail. So I had some classes on, on doing the numbers. So the numbers are very important. You know, if you don't know your numbers, you don't know your business. So you've got to know the numbers. Then I, I got some really great training in the restaurant industry. So I learned how to lead, delegate, motivate. And I learned how to, again, it was, you know, re restaurants are all about numbers, squeezing a nickel out of a penny. So every dollar counts in the restaurant industry that transfers well into real estate and especially into development. And then that whole leadership thing, learning the difference between a manager and a leader, you have to know how to manage, but you also need to know how to lead. You need to know how to delegate and you need to know how to uh, recruit, hire, train, lead, delegate, motivate, put the right people in the right seats as you're growing an organization. And you have to be able to let go of that control and that ego and understand that none of us are as smart as all of us and that there are better, smarter people, people out there than, than you. And of course, even though I'm not formally classically educated you know, in, in the college sense, I'm very self-educated. So I poured into myself my entire career. I still do now every single day. Um, you know, back in the day when it was cassette tapes and then the CDs and then the, you know, 80 gig iPod, which I still have my 80 gig iPod, no music, none. It was all personal, professional development stuff, business stuff. That's all I listened to. Now, of course, I'll play some music here and there. And I love music. I was a musician, you know, in high school. But, you know, when it comes to what I spend my time on, when I have spare time, it's making myself better, smarter, more capable in some way. So that's really the key. And then, as you grow, what I did was I found people. So I'd never built a house before I built houses. Mm -hmm. So what I did was I went and hired um, the best people from the best company that I wanted to be to come work with me and build my organization with me and for me instead of trying to do it myself. So I have I had no ego. I was never threatened by anybody who was better and smarter and more experienced than me. I brought them on my team 
and I turn them loose to do their job. So that's that's how it works. That you know, that's an intriguing, uh, intriguing kind of hack that you you mentioned there, and, and and even not having an ego. How do you convince someone to come work for you when they already have more skills? They are you know they've been in the business longer. What, what's the what's the bait you use to say, hey, come work, come work with me, as opposed to staying where you are? Because you know, you so can. first of all, it's having a big vision and it's being able to articulate that vision in a way that inspires others. So, so you inspire results out of others. Leaders inspire, right? And we're seeing a real life example of that right now playing out on the world stage. So leaders inspire results out of others. So what I do is I created a vision of what I wanted to create. I wanted to create this building and development company it was on the leading edge of technology that gave back to the community that provided a positive work environment for everybody. And the upside potential for that individual was unlimited. We were gonna share profits, uh, you know, those types of things. So basically for the individuals that I was looking for, it was like, you had the ability to come build a company the way you think it needed to be done, to be an entrepreneur, to be self-employed under the umbrella of a corporation so that you didn't have to take the risk and worry about the downside, but you got to share in all of the upside. So. You know, what you find with a lot of people is, you know, they're, you know, a lot of people aren't satisfied or happy, happy where they are because they can't contribute. They can't right. have their ideas come to life. They're not allowed to do things outside the corporate box and, you know, check in the boxes that they're in. So, you know, I just look for people that wanted a chance to build something special and unique. And not only that, but just let them do it. Let them make mistakes. Let them, you know, do things and build a company the way that they they thought it should be done. And, you know, people really respond to the opportunity to create something that they've spent their entire life doing, but never had a, had, had a chance to build on their own. Right. Yeah. How do you structure that such that, you know, maybe, you know, because I think one, one, of the, one of the questions I would have, how do you structure that in such a way that you're not giving away the farm, you know, preemptively? I mean, you're going to bring somebody on and yet while you know they may be performing in their current role, maybe they come and work for you and completely flounder. How do you protect for that downside risk for you as the one bringing them on and, and giving up a slice of equity? Well, you know, you're always taking a risk on people, but, you know, ideally you try to discern through the process whether they're competent or not. You're going to know based on their track record, where they come from and, you know, things like that in terms of talking to them and how they handle things, how they deal with people and situations. But at the end of the day, Everybody that ever you know came to work with me, it was it was you know a trial basis, and you know you started up front with, hey, this is a trial basis. This may or may not be a good fit for you, may or may not be a good fit for us, but we're going to try it. We're going to see what happens. And then there's performance standards and benchmarks, right? So you know there are specific things that that individual is brought on board to do, and you measure that performance. So that all goes back to leading, delegating, motivating, managing employees correctly, you know, um, providing clear direction in no uncertain terms, exactly what you expect and when holding people accountable to the goals, measuring performance and behavior, not personal, you know, so it's never measuring the person or, or, you know, making things personal. It's always about the business. It's always about the performance, always about the behavior. And you set very specific goals and you track those goals and you help people, um, you know, hold themselves accountable to those goals and you track their performance and then they can share in the upside. So that's basically, you know, how it, you know, how that evolved and how that works. Got it. That's uh, that's really, really intriguing. You're now, you know, full-time developer. You've done projects all across the Southeast. What does that mean for you? And if someone were to get into development today, what are some things you're looking at? So number one, you have to, well, so you're talking about projects, what type of projects to get into right now. Um, so at the moment, I'm really focused on land. And there's been different points in, the, in my career where I'm focused on different things. And it really depends on what the individual's business model is what their needs are, where they are financially, all those different things. So me personally, I started out doing spec houses. Mm. So that was the, you know, that was just the world I was in. I was flipping land and I was doing spec houses. And then, you know, then I started doing land development. Then I started doing commercial mixed use, you know, so it kind of scaled from there. So it really depends on the individual, their skills, their abilities, their background, you know, what their, what their net worth looks like, the ability to raise capital, all of those things. So uh, everything is different for everybody. And then every market's different. So every market has different needs. You know, you're in Memphis, you know, that area, you know, maybe you need multifamily, maybe you need some condo buildings, maybe you need, you know, an industrial park. So every area, every market, every, you know, thing is different. And I've developed all those. So, you know, self-storage, you know, whole nine yards. So, you know, it's not more of, for me as an opportunistic developer, uh, you know, it's more of what is the opportunity in the markets that I'm looking at, what opportunities come my way. 
And, you know, how can I make the best use of those? And I do a lot of adaptive reuse where I take existing buildings and turn them into something else. Mm. You know, so I really love that. That's one of my favorite things to do, especially older buildings and, you know, neat areas that that can be, uh, you know, higher, better use of something else. So, it, you know, there really is no best thing, but obviously the number one thing everybody needs, and we've seen it through the, through the pandemic and, you know, during economic crisis, everybody needs a roof over their head. Everybody's got to put right now gas in their tank. You got to buy food. You have to go to the doctor, uh, you know, you have to put clothes on your back. So when you look at those core things that you need to survive, you know, from a developer, you know, if I'm going to be a real estate developer, real estate investor, I want to own the things that aren't ever going away. The things mm -hmm. that can't be outsourced, can't be put fully online, that people need to set foot through the door in order to receive that service or that product. So if you look at those types of things, you know, they're never going to go away from a physical asset standpoint. So you got to look at each market, you know, what are the needs in those markets? And then what are the trends? You know, what are the emerging areas, you know, and those types of things? And more importantly than that, where's the population going? So you want to do things in an area where the population's increasing, because if you have increasing population, all of the other fundamentals around uh, a development thesis or an investment thesis are going to be there. Right. Yeah, I, I absolutely get that. How how do you find opportunities today? Is this stuff that's just coming to you? Are you guys actively going out and trying to get in front of development, you know, the path of progress and saying, OK, you know, this is maybe where we should start buying land or what, what's that look like? So in this day and age, I've got a huge network uh, where I'm very well known. So projects just land in my lap every day. And if it's something I'm interested in, I'll pursue it. If not, I've got a big network of clients that I'm mentoring all over the country that are looking for opportunities and I will pass it along to them depending on what it is. But yeah, I get deals coming across my desk every single day for not only real estate and development, but for companies. So I buy companies, build them up, you know, that type of thing. So I get all kinds of opportunities every day. When I first started out, I had to farm. I had to go build relationships. I had to contact property owners directly. I had to contact brokers. So I had to do all of that when I first started out. And especially when I was building and developing infill development spec houses, I would go farm my market and I would contact you know, all the property owners in the area that owned land that was vacant, ready to build on. Uh, and I had a, a system for doing that. And then of course, all of the real estate brokers in the area knew it, that I was a buyer. And you know, if they had anything, they would come to me first. So it's kind of building that reputation is the is really the, the best way to do it. Yep. I love that. When it comes to mentorship, which is one of the things that uh, I know you're known for, do you bring on people that have no development experience or do you recommend they go out and get experience before they come and start chatting with you? No, I've got, I've got a couple of clients right now that have zero development experience. One of them uh, is a former NFL uh, player. He actually holds the world record for the longest kickoff run back in a Super Bowl and uh, for a touchdown. And yeah, he's never been a developer, never invested in real estate. And I'm teaching him how to build a real estate development company. And uh, he's got his first project going right now. It's a multifamily, uh, ground up multifamily, you know, 54 units, I think it's going to be uh, on a family property. Mm. So this is his first foray into development. I've got another guy that was a house flipper that, you know, I'm helping him bring his first project out of the ground. It's 129 units, 20, $25 million multifamily ground up project, never done it before. I've got a dentist who has a construction uh, license and he builds dental practices and kind of coaches and mentors people and builds, you know, their offices out. So he does that as a business model, as a general contractor. Um, I'm teaching him how to be a developer and he's doing a mixed use development. Mm. Uh, first time he's ever done that he land development project, mixed use. And of course he's going to do the vertical as well. So yeah, yeah you know, it's, it's kind of runs the gamut. I love that. What are some risks you're seeing right now, just considering the uh, economic times we're in, maybe, you know, what's going on in the world stage? I mean, you see lots of lots of uh, just kind of unknowns, not that we ever have much certainty in this life, but, um, you know, th there are some, it is kind of a unique time. What are some risks you're seeing in just development in general right now? Yeah, so costs obviously are, are volatile right now and all over the map. So it's really difficult to nail costs on a project just because of, of all the things we're dealing with. And then interest rate is going to become risk, you know, here soon. Right now, you know, it's varying a little bit, but depending on what the Fed does at their at their meetings in terms of their interest rate policy for the year, you know, that's that's going to affect um, you know, your costs there. But that's kind of normal in the development business. You know what it is going into it, you know what it's going to be coming out of it. So you can mitigate that. The biggest risk right now is construction costs. That's something you just can't account for. And you just don't know where that's going to be based on when you start, depending on the project. Some of these projects are multi-year projects. 
uh, and you know, depending on the size and the scope of it, uh, you, you just don't know where things are going to be. But I've seen it before, and I've been through it before. Costs, you know, they they're always doing this. This is very unique in the in the times that we're in now. But eventually, it will come back around, and costs will, you know, settle in, and they'll be more predictable again in the future. But you just can't nail a cost right now. Right, right. Outside of costs, are, I mean, one of the things we saw in the in the financial crisis. I mean, building and development just came to a, a screeching halt. At least that's what my memory of it was. I was not a developer then, and I'm not one now. I just remember seeing lots and lots of projects that just stalled out. Yeah, 2008-9. Yeah. So what are yeah. you, talk, talk to us about then and how maybe is is now different, or is that a potential uh, potential yet again? Now, very different right now. So what happened back then was too much supply. So too much development going on. And then the banking crisis happened, which, you know, eliminated the ability to borrow money for a lot of people. So, you know, that was kind of a cascading domino effect there. But the biggest thing was overbuilding. It just overbuilt. Everybody was a developer. Everybody was, you know, able to get money to do projects. And we, you know, we were just outpacing demand. Mm -hmm. This time, demand is a, is a big, you know, there's a big demand out there and very little inventory in most markets for anything and everything. I mean, everything is undersupplied right now. So very unique time in the market from a demand supply side standpoint in you know inventory for residential mostly some commercial assets now there's other commercial assets that are still oversupplied obviously retail office all of the things that took a hit during you know the pandemic but you know housing is still undersupplied in most areas and the demand that's out there uh, from a development standpoint cannot be built through over the next 10 years because we don't have enough labor so mm. that's really your big issue. So that that's the other risk really is, you know, in, in terms of costs and interest rates is the time cycle of a project. You can't nail that either because there's not enough labor out there to get things done. So things are taking, you know, almost twice as long as they did even three or four years ago. How how are people overcoming the labor shortage? What it, what it, What are some ways that you're seeing people creatively solve that problem? You know, there really isn't because there just aren't enough people entering the trades. That's your biggest problem. And what's happening is a lot of the guys have been in the trades for 20, 30 years. They're, they're retiring and there's nobody coming up behind them at scale. So there's, there's a number, obviously, but not enough to replace and grow the industry. So there's, you know, people are trying trade school stuff, bonuses, incentives. But, you know, people just don't want to go into that industry. People are, are going into other industries now with tech and with you know, all the different things that we have and with the online world that we live in and with, you know, online trading and cryptocurrencies, I mean, people are quitting their jobs and they're doing these other things instead. So, uh, you know, there really isn't anything creatively being done at scale that can be done because there's just such a lack of interest in going into the fields, you know, really, uh, you know, where a lot of the labor comes from is from people immigrating into the country. And, you know, doing doing those jobs. And, uh, you know, that's one solution that could be provided. There's a lot of people outside this country that want to come in that want to do these jobs that are tradesmen from other countries. So, you know, that's one way to help fill the gaps. But obviously, you know, we don't have the systems to handle that at scale in, in the country right now. Right. That's absolutely intriguing. Greg, thanks for making the time today to really break down uh, your kind of history of how you started out, how you grew so many companies and just kind of your general mindset, as well as sharing some nuggets on, you know, what's going on in the market now and how it's different than the financial crisis, as well as, uh, you know, how to get started in development. So this was absolutely fantastic. I thank you for your time today. If our listeners want to get in touch with you or learn more about you, what is the best way to do that? Yeah, gregdickerson.com. All my social links are there. I have a YouTube channel with uh, lots of videos on real estate development and investing and all kinds of other things. So gregdickerson.com. Thank you, Greg. Have a great day. Yep, you as well.